Shavua Tov Rabotai, we are continuing with our Mishnah Yumi Masechet Rosh Hashanah, we are up to Perek Bed Mishnah Tet, today's Mishnah Yot should be Le'enu Nishmad, Neria Ben Svetlana, Aranbaiv, Neriyahu Ben Burcha Yisraelov, Minuchatam Began Eden, Amen, and Le'abdi Ben Chaim Dachaim, for the Refua Shenema of Bacha Bat Esther, and Daniel Shalom Ben Rosa, Betor Shachu Le'Israel. The incident recorded at the end of the previous Mishnah took place at the beginning of the month of Tishrei, Therefore, according to Rabbi Yeshua, the festivals of that Tishrei, including Yom Kippur, occurred one day later than Rabban Gamliel determined. Rabban Gamliel, who was the Nasi, the head of the Bedin, wanted to avoid a division in the Jewish people, with some people observing Yom Kippur on the official date and others observing it the next day. Therefore, Rabban Gamliel insisted that Rabbi Yeshua pub- publicly submit to the court's ruling. The Mishnah begins, Shalach lo Rabban Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel sent him the following message. Gozrani alecha shetavo etzli b'maklecha uvimotecha b'yom ha-kippurim shecha liot b'cheshbuncha. I decree that you come before me with your walking stick and your money and Yom Kippur as it falls according to your calculation. Rabban Gamliel ordered the Bishua to treat that day as an ordinary day by appearing before him with his walking stick and money, publicly showing his submission to the court's authority. Although Rabbi Dosa bin Okinos had also challenged Rabban Gamliel's position, like we stated in the previous Mishnah, Rabban Gamliel sent this order only to Rabbi Yeshua. Rabban Gamliel's reason for this was that Rabbi Yeshua was the Abedin, the father of the Sanhedrin, second only to Rabban Gamliel himself. And so there was real concern that people would follow him. Halach umtsao Rabbi Akiva Metzer. Rabbi Akiva went and found Rabbi Yeshua troubled over having been ordered by the Nasi to desecrate the Yom Kippur of his calculation. Amar lo Rabbi Akiva said to him, "Yesh li l'mod shekol ma sheasa Rabban Gamliel asui. I can derive from the Torah that whatever Rabban Gamliel did is done, meaning the court's decision." Regarding the date of Rosh Chodesh is legally binding even if it is a mistake. Shenemar, because it is stated in Seven Vaikra chapter 23, Pasuk 4, Elem Oadea Adonai Mikrei Kodesh. These are the festivals of Hashem, holy gatherings. Ashot Tikru Otam, which you shall declare. Ben Bismanan, Ben Shro Bismanan, Eli Moadot El Elu. By stating that God's festivals depend on what you shall declare, the verse indicates that regardless of whether the Bedin declares the festivals in their correct time or not in their correct time, I, God says, have no festivals other than these. Who has stayed in the previous Mishnah initially took the same position as he did. If we are going to challenge the court of Rabban Gamliel, we will have to challenge every court that stood from the days of Moshe until now. Shneimar, because it is stated in Sefer Shemot, chapter 24, pasuk 9, Vayal Moshe v'Aaron nadav aviyu v'shivim mizikne Yisrael. Moshe and Aaron nadav and aviyu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up. V'lama lo nitparshu shmotan shezkinim? Why were the names of the 70 elders who were judges in the court of Moshe not mentioned? This is only to teach us that every court of three judges that was appointed as a Bedin over Israel is like the court of Moshe. If someone claims that the judges of his generation are not as great as Moshe and Aaron, we can say to them that although that may be true, they might be as great as the other judges of Moshe's court whose names were not mentioned. Since they are not named, we do not know of their greatness and their excellence. Therefore, by omitting their names, the Torah warns us against assuming that our judges are inferior to them. And Rabbi Yeshua obeyed Rabban Gamliel's command. Natal Maklo Maotav Biado Valach Liavnets and Rabban Gamliel Biom Shechal Yom Kippurim Liot Bechishbono. He took his walking stick and his money in his hand and went to Yavne, the seat of the Sanhedrin at that time, to Rabban Gamliel. On the day the Yom Kippur fell according to his calculation, Amad Rabban Gamliel al Rosho Rabban Gamliel stood up and kissed him on his head. Amarlu, he said to him, Bo Shalom Rabbi Come in peace, my teacher and my student. 
Rebi Bechokma, Betalmidi, Shikibalta Dvarai. You are my teacher in matters of wisdom, but you are also my student because you accepted my words. And that is end of Perik Bet Mishnah Tet. We continue now with Perik Gimel Mishnah Aleph. The Mishnah continues its discussion of the laws of Kiddush HaChodesh, the process of determining when Rosh Chodesh falls. In chapter 2, Mishnah 7, we learn that the Bedin must declare the date to be Rosh Chodesh by saying it is sanctified. The following Mishnah discusses this rule further. The Mishnah begins, Ra'u Bedin v'chol Yisrael, even if all the judges of the Bedin and every member of the Jewish people, a very large number of people, saw the new moon on the night that starts the 30th day, Nechkeru Ha'edim, or if the witnesses were questioned on the 30th day, V'lo yispiku l'mal mikudash at shechashecha, but in either case, the Bedin did not manage to say it is sanctified until after it grew dark at the end of the 30th day, meaning until after three stars appeared in the sky. Harizim me'ubar, then the outgoing month is full, meaning the 30th day belongs to the outgoing month, making it full. And the next day, the 31st, is Rosh Chodesh. Were the Bedin to have made the declaration before three stars appeared, the declaration would have been valid even if the sun had already set because it is still considered day for the purpose of Kiddush HaChodesh, but since they did not, uh, they did not make it in time, until after it grew dark, until after three stars appeared in the sky, like we said, the outgoing month is full, the 30th day belongs to outgoing month, and the next day, the 31st, is Rosh Chodesh. Since the Bedin did not make the declaration while it was still daytime, they can no longer make the declaration at all, because the declaration at night is invalid. Without a declaration, the 30th day cannot become Rosh Chodesh, and so Rosh Chodesh is automatically delayed until the 31st. When Rosh Chodesh is not declared on the 30th, it falls automatically on the 31st without a declaration, like we saw in chapter 2, Mishnah 7, and the Rambam writes in the Chod Kiddush HaChodesh, chapter 1, al Al-Lacha 3. With each of these two cases, the Mishnah makes a different point. The first case teaches that even though the Bedin and all the people saw the new moon themselves, an official declaration is still needed. The second case teaches that even if the Bedin finish questioning the witnesses during the daytime, they cannot complete the process of Kiddush HaChodesh by saying it is sanctified after nightfall. Although Bedin can finish certain other matters at night if they had begun dealing with them during the day, the process of Kiddush HaChodesh must be completed in the daytime. The Mishnah now discusses the procedure for Kiddush HaChodesh where the only people who saw the new moon were the judges of the Bedin. Ra'u Bedin Bilvad, if only the judges of the great Bedin, din, the Sanhedrin, saw the new moon on the night that starts the 30th day, and there was no other witness, the law is as follows. Ya'amdu shnaim ve'idu bifnaim. In the daytime of the 30th, two of them should stand, witnesses must stand when they testify, it says in Masechet Shvot, chapter uh, page 30a. So again, in the daytime of the 30th, two of them should stand and testify before the others that they saw the new moon. And the others should say, it is sanctified, it is sanctified. In fact, the judges of a bedding can declare Rosh Chodesh based on their own sighting of the moon without the testimony of any witnesses because their sighting is at least as effective as hearing about the moon from witnesses. In the Mishnah's case, however, the bedding had to accept testimony because they saw the new moon at night. Just as night is not a valid time to accept the witness testimony, so it is not a valid time for a bedding's own sighting to be treated as the equivalent of accepting testimony. Therefore, despite the fact that the judges of the Bedin saw the Rumun themselves, they must still go through the process of hearing the testimony of witnesses. This is what the Rav explains. In the next case, only three members of the great Bedin saw the Rumun and there were no other witnesses at all. Raush, Rosha, Ben, Bedin, if only three people saw them, they are the judges of the Bedin. Yamdu Ashnaim, two of them should stand ready to testify. They should seat two others from among their colleagues next to a single member, meaning two of the judges should join the third witness, who is also a judge, to form a bed of three. The Eidu Bifnam, then the standing witnesses should testify in front of them. The Yomru Mikudash Mikudash, and the three seated judges should say, It is sanctified, it is sanctified. The third witness cannot serve as a judge on his own because a single judge is not relied upon to accept testimony and proclaim Rosh Chodesh by himself. A minimum of three judges is required. Even though a single expert can judge financial cases, he cannot perform Kiddush HaChodesh. And this law is derived from a verse in the Torah, as the Gemara says on page 25b, Mesechet Rosh Hashanah. Although the Mishnah speaks of sitting two new judges and having one of, them, uh, one of the witnesses join them, that is not the only option. It is also possible to bring in three new judges, in which case none of the witnesses would be required to serve as a judge. 
The Mishnah's point is that at least two judges must be added so that together with one of the witnesses, a court of three is formed because three judges is the minimum for Kiddush HaChodesh. And that is in Rabotev, today's Mishnah Yomi. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen.